Miss Carroll. We, of course, know this 18th century London melody by the name God Rest Ye Merry, Gentlemen. Here's the last verse of the earliest printed edition from 1775. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place, like we true loving brethren, each now other to embrace. For the merry time of Christmas is coming on apace, O tidings of comfort and joy. The saxophone quartet version you hear tonight is also arranged by our own Leonard Olson. considered one of the loveliest classical works ever written for the Christmas season. The Shepherd's Farewell by Hector Berlioz started out as a simple organ piece that later turned into a choral movement describing the lowly shepherd's heartfelt farewell to the baby Jesus. This simple movement would become the cornerstone of Berlioz's full-length cantata, L'Enfance du Christ, the childhood of Christ. Now we must leave thy lowly dwelling, the humble crib, the stable bear. Babe, all mortal babes excelling, content our earthly lot to share. Loving father, loving mother, sheltered thee with tender care.
It's with a great deal of personal pride that uh, I introduce two former students, not only of mine, but at Loma Linda Academy. Dr. John Carter, who will accompany Mr. Dvardy's offertory solo, and John's wife, Tiffany, who will join me a bit later in today's program. Dr. Carter is director of bands and chairman of the music faculty at Loma Linda Academy. Tiffany Carter works in corporate sponsorships for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. As the deacons come forward, let us pray for today's offering. Our Father, we thank you for our young people and the school they represent. We ask your blessing on them and the offering given today. May the funds multiply the work of the Vespers Committee in furthering their mission to this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Next week's Vespers program will be the traditional English nine lessons and carols heralding the birth of our Savior. We hope you will come at 4.30 to sing some familiar carols and hear the story unfold about the reason for the season. The following is a four-movement suite that was arranged for saxophone quartet 
by Bill Holcomb, who has done a lot of arrangements for band and instrumental ensembles. These are among the classiest arrangements of Christmas songs that we've ever had the pleasure of playing. It includes Joy to the World, Angels We Have Heard on High, O Holy Night, and Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Joy to the World, the tune Antioch, presumably was named to commemorate the early church in Antioch, Syria, where the disciples were first called Christians. It was published by Lowell Mason in 1836. He noted it was arranged from Handel. A similarity can be heard in the opening four notes of the melody, which recall the beginning of two choruses from the Messiah. Lift up your heads and glory to God. This traditional French carol actually has some roots here in California. This traditional French carol with both text and tune dates from the 18th century. Gloria in excelsis Deo, or Glory to God in the Highest, is a direct quote from the earliest recorded Christian hymn of praise, voiced by the angels who appeared to the shepherds announcing the birth of Jesus. Glory to God in the highest. The tr French traditional melody, Gloria, has always been wedded to this text. The hymn arrangement is by Edwin Shippen Barnes, who graduated from Yale University and studied under the great organist Louis Vierne in Paris before serving in Presbyterian churches in New York Philadelphia, and Santa Monica, California. He retired to the beautiful mountain community of Idlewild, California in 1954. He donated a small organ to the church there and played it until his death in 1958. Angels, we have heard on high.
O Holy Night was composed by the noted French composer and music critic Adolphe Adam in 1847. And it has a unique claim to fame. On December 24th, 1906, 1906, it was a part of the first ever AM radio broadcast, and it is the first piece of music to actually be played live over the airways. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This hymn was written by Charles Wesley and published in 1739. The tune Mendelssohn is part of the second movement of Festival Song for the Artists, composed by Felix Mendelssohn for the Gutenberg Festival of Leipzig in 1840 to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the invention of printing. It was arranged as a hymn tune in 1856 by William Heyman Cummings to fit Wesley's words and named in honor of the original composer. Before his death in 1847, Mendelssohn himself prophesied falsely, as it turned out, that while singers and hearers might like the tune, it would never be appropriate for sacred words. It's too bad he never knew Mr. Cummings.
The Littlest Angel by Charles Tazewell. This is for the young ones in our audience and the young at heart in our audience. The Littlest Angel was born in 1939 when Screen Guild producers informed scriptwriter Charles Tazewell that he must write something. They anticipated a crisis with a current production, and Tazewell's creation would serve as a backup. Well, the crisis never materialized, but the littlest angel did. At the time of Tazewell's death in 1972, the Christmas story was in its 38th printing and was called an international classic by Time magazine. Today, The Littlest Angel has sold over five million copies and is one of the all-time best-selling children's books. Once upon a time, oh, many, many years ago, as time is calculated by men, but which was only yesterday in the celestial calendar of heaven, there was in paradise a most miserable, thoroughly unhappy, an utterly dejected cherub who was known throughout heaven as the littlest angel. He was exactly four years, six months, five days, seven hours, and 42 minutes of age when he presented himself to the venerable gatekeeper and waited for admittance to the glorious kingdom of God. Standing defiantly, the littlest angel tried to pretend that he wasn't at all impressed by such unearthly splendor and that he wasn't afraid at all. But his lower lip trembled and a tear disgraced him by making a new furrow down his already tear-streaked face, coming to a precipitous halt at the very tip of his small freckled nose. But that wasn't all. While the kindly gatekeeper was entering the name in his great book, the littlest angel, having left home as usual without a handkerchief, endeavored to hide the telltale evidence by snuffing, a most unangelic sound which so unnerved the good gatekeeper that he did something he had never done before in all eternity. He blotted the page. From that moment on, the heavenly peace was never quite the same, and the littlest angel soon became the despair of all the heavenly host. His shrill, ear-splitting whistle resounded at all hours throughout the golden streets. It startled the patriarch prophets and disturbed their meditations. Yes, and on top of that, he inevitably sang off-key at the singing practice of the heavenly choir, spoiling its ethereal effect. And being so small that it seemed to take him just twice as long as anyone else to get to nightly prayers, the littlest angel always arrived late and always knocked everyone's wings askew as he darted into place. Although these flaws in behavior might have been overlooked, the general appearance of the littlest angel was even more disreputable than his deportment. It was first whispered among the seraphim and cherubim, and then said aloud among the angels and archangels that he didn't even look like an angel. And they were all quite right. He didn't. His halo was permanently star tarnished where he held on to it with a hot little chubby hand when he ran, and he was always running. Furthermore, even when he stood very still, it never behaved as a halo should, it was always slipping down over his right eye or over his left eye or else just for pure meanness, slipping off the back of his head and rolling away down some golden street just so he'd have to chase after it. Yes, and it must be here recorded that his wings were neither useful nor ornamental. All paradise held its breath when the littlest angel perched himself like an unhappy fledgling sparrow on the very edge of a gilded cloud and prepared to take off. He would teeter this way and that way, but after much coaxing and a few false starts, he would shut both his eyes, hold his freckled nose, count up to 303, and then hurl himself slowly into space. However, 
Owing to the regrettable fact that he always forgot to move his wings, the littlest angel always fell head over halo. It was also reported and never denied that whenever he was nervous, which was most of the time, he bit his wingtips. Now, anyone can easily understand why the littlest angel would sooner or later have to be disciplined. And so, on an eternal day of an eternal month in the year eternal, he was directed to present his small self before an angel of the peace. The littlest angel combed his hair, dusted his wings, and scrambled into an almost clean garment, and then, with a heavy heart, trudged his way to the place of judgment. He tried to postpone the dreaded ordeal by loitering along the street of the guardian angels, pausing a few timeless moments to minutely inspect the long list of new arrivals, although all heaven knew that he couldn't read a word. And he idled more than a several immortal moments to carefully examine a display of harps, although everyone in the celestial city knew he couldn't play a note. But at length and at last, he slowly approached a doorway, which was surmounted by a pair of golden scales signifying that heavenly justice was dispensed within. To the littlest angel's great surprise, he heard a merry voice singing. The littlest angel removed his halo and breathed upon it heavily, then polished it upon his robe, a procedure which added nothing to his already untidy appearance, and then he tiptoed in. The singer, who was known as the understanding angel, looked down at the small culprit and the littlest angel instantly tried to make himself invisible by the ingenious process of withdrawing his head into his robe, very much like a snapping turtle. At that, the singer laughed a jolly, heartwarming sound and said, Oh, so you're the one who's been making heaven so unheavenly. Come here, cherub, and tell me all about it. The littlest angel ventured a furtive look, first one eye and then the other eye. Suddenly, almost before he knew it, he was standing close to the understanding angel and was explaining how very difficult it was for a boy who suddenly finds himself transformed into an angel. Yes, and no matter what the archangel said, he'd only swung once, well, twice. Oh, all right then, he'd swung three times on the Golden Gates, but that was just for something to do. That was the whole trouble. There wasn't anything for a small angel to do, and he was very homesick. Oh, not that paradise wasn't beautiful, but the earth was beautiful too. Wasn't it created by God himself? Why, there were trees to climb, and brooks to fish, and caves to play at pirate chief, the swimming hole, and sun and rain, and dark and dawn, and thick brown dust so soft and warm beneath your feet. The understanding angel smiled, and in his eyes was a long forgotten memory of another small boy from long ago. Then he asked the littlest angel what would make him most happy in paradise. The cherub thought for a moment and whispered in his ear, there's a box. I left it under my bed back home. If only I could have that. The understanding angel nodded and said, you shall have it. He promised, and a fleet-winged heavenly messenger was instantly dispatched to bring the box to paradise. And then, in all those timeless days that followed, everyone wondered at the great change in the littlest angel. For among all the cherubs in God's kingdom, he was the most happy. His conduct was above the slightest reproach. His appearance was all that the most fastidious could wish for. And on excursions to Elysian fields, it could be said, and truly said, that he flew like an angel. Then it came to pass that Jesus, the Son of God, was to be born to Mary in Bethlehem in Judea. 
And as the glorious tidings spread throughout paradise, all the angels rejoiced and their voices were lifted to herald the miracle of miracles, the coming of the Christ child. The angels and archangels, the seraphim and cherubim, the gatekeeper, the wing maker, yes, and even the halo smith put aside their usual tasks to prepare their gifts for the blessed infant. All but the littlest angel, he sat himself down on the topmost step of the golden stairs and anxiously waited for inspiration. What could he give that would be the most accessible acceptable to the Son of God. At one time, he dreamed of composing a lyric hymn of adoration, but the littlest angel was woefully wanting in musical talent. Then he grew tremendously excited over writing a prayer, a prayer that should live in the hearts of men because it would be the first prayer ever to be heard by the Christ child. But the littlest angel was lamentably lacking in literate skill. What, oh what, could a small angel give that would please the holy infant? The time of the miracle was very close at hand when the littlest angel at last decided on his gift. Then, on that day of days, he proudly brought it from its hiding place beneath a cloud and humbly, with downcast eyes, placed it before the throne of God it was only a small, rough, unsightly box, but inside were all those wonderful things that even a child of God would treasure. A small, rough, unsightly box lying among all those other glorious gifts from all the angels of paradise, gifts of such rare and radiant splendor and breathless beauty that heaven and all the universe were lighted by the mere reflection of their glory. And when the littlest angel saw this, he suddenly knew that his gift to God's child was irreverent, and he devoutly wished he might reclaim his shabby gift. It was ugly, it was worthless. If only he could hide it away from the sight of God before it was even noticed, but it was too late. The hand of God moved slowly over that bright array of shining gifts, then paused, then dropped, then came to rest on the lowly gift of the littlest angel. The littlest angel trembled as the box was opened, and there before his eyes, the eyes of God and all his heavenly host, was what he offered the Christ child. And what was his gift to the blessed infant? Well, there was a butterfly with golden wings captured one bright summer day on the hills above Jerusalem, and a sky blue egg from the bird's nest in the olive tree that sh stood to shade his mother's kitchen door. Yes, and two white stones found on a muddy riverbank where he and his friends had played like small brown beavers. And at the bottom of the box, a limp, tooth marked leather strap, once worn as a collar by his mongrel dog who had died as he had lived, in absolute love and infinite devotion. The littlest angel wept hot, bitter tears, for now he knew that instead of honoring the Son of God, he had been most blasphemous. Why had he ever thought that that box was so wonderful? Why had he dreamed that such utterly useless things would be loved by the blessed infant? In frantic terror, he turned to run and hide from the divine wrath of the Heavenly Father, but he stumbled and fell, and with a horrified wail and a clatter of halo, rolled into a ball of misery at the very foot of the heavenly throne. There was an ominous and dreadful silence in the celestial city, a silence complete and undisturbed save for the heartbroken sobbing of the littlest angel. Then suddenly the voice of God, like divine music, rose and swelled throughout paradise. And the voice of God spoke, saying, of all the gifts of all the angels, I find that this small box pleases me most. Its contents are of the earth and of men, 
and my son is born to be king of both. These are the things my son too will know and love and cherish, and then regretfully will leave behind him when his task is done. I accept this gift in the name of the child, Jesus, born of Mary this night in Bethlehem. There was a breathless pause, and then the rough, unsightly box of the littlest angel began to glow with a bright, unearthly light. Then the light became a lustrous flame, and the flame became a radiant brilliance that blinded the eyes of all the angels. None but the littlest angel saw it rise from its place before the throne of God, and he, and only he, watched it arch away from heaven and shed its clear, white, beckoning light over a stable where a child was born. There it shone on that night of miracles, and its light was reflected down the centuries deep in the heart of all mankind. Yet earthly eyes, blinded too by its splendor, could never know that the lowly gift of the littlest angel was what all men would call forever the, the shining, shining star, star of, of Bethlehem. Bethlehem. sure of the words, please join the saxophone quartet to sing the first and fourth verses of Silent Night. If you need the hymnal, it's on page 143. It should be on the screen as well.
Let us pray. As we depart, may the shining, wondrous star of Bethlehem illumine our lives to behold the redemption and salvation offered through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, and good night.